And you can turn to begin in 1 Kings chapter 20, as you saw probably. The message is called Two Pools and a Miracle. Two Pools and a Miracle. We're going to talk about two pools in Jerusalem. Not swimming pools. They're for different reasons, the two pools. And I want to let you know that um, in Jerusalem, there are a lot of ritual cleansing pools, small, smaller than what we're going to talk about tonight, called the mikveh or mikveh oat. There's many of those throughout Jerusalem. Um, and underneath the Temple Mount, they have discovered 35 storage pools or, or tanks, and they hold over 10 million gallons of water, over 10 million gallons in 35 uh, cisterns or water tanks stored that were carved into the rock under the Temple Mount. The first pool we're going to talk about is the uh, lower pool. There are two pools mentioned in the scripture in the Old Testament, an upper pool and a lower pool. Now, there are other pools mentioned, but two that we're talking about. And what we're going to do is we're going to identify the upper pool of the Old Testament with a pool in the New Testament and the lower pool of the Old Testament with a pool in the New Testament. So you'll see they're both the same ones and uh, different things happen there, of course. The first pool, the lower pool. This is also known as the Pool of Siloam, the Pool of Siloam. This was built by King Hezekiah, and it was built at a time when he was under attack prior to the attack by the Assyrians. And the water source for Jerusalem, the Gihon Spring, was outside of the city walls. Now, if you have your water source outside of your city walls, an army comes to attack, you're inside the walls, you got a problem. You can't get to the water. Not only can you not get to the water, but your enemy can. And so they have plenty of water and you're dying of thirst. So King Hezekiah, he blocked the pool, the, the spring, on the outside. He cut a rock-cut tunnel through the rock, bringing the water from the pool inside the walls of Jerusalem. And then he cut a tunnel down to it. It was a tremendous engineering feat. There's an inscription on the wall from the time saying that this was, was the one. Now in 2 Kings 20, <clears throat> we have mention of it. And I'm just having it turn there just so you can see the biblical reference to this pool. This is the lower pool. And it's verse 20, 2 Kings 20, verse 20, 2020. And the rest of the acts of Hezekiah and all his might and how he made a pool... And a conduit, conduit is simply a water channel, um, and brought water into the city. Are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? So that's a reference, a direct reference to this engineering marvel of King Hezekiah. Now he was uh, defending the city against Sennacherib, who was uh, the king of Assyria. As you know, Sennacherib came and destroyed I, didn't, I forget the number, 23, 24, a number of cities of Judah, and attacked Jerusalem, but was unable. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So, it's constructed in Isaiah 22, verse 9. Another reference to it, Isaiah 22, verse 9. You have seen also the breaches of the city of David, that there are many, and you gathered together the waters of the lower pool. Now, that's where it's mentioned as the lower pool, but it's mentioned in conjunction with the city of David. Those of you who are in Israel with us, you know when we went to the Pool of Siloam, how did we get there? We went through the city of David to get there. It is right next to the, right below the city of David. So that's the lower pool. Now, we're going to go to, um, let's go to John chapter 7. John, Gospel of John chapter 7. We're going to go to two places in John. The first one is chapter 7. And in Gospel of John chapter 7, the reason I'm having you turn there is because the waters of the Pool of Siloam were used for several ceremonies in Jerusalem. And one of the ceremonies was mentioned in, and I'm not going to have you turn there, Leviticus 19. Have you ever heard of the ashes of the red heifer? That is a cleansing ceremony in which they would take a red heifer and after it was burned on the altar or burned as a sacrifice, they would collect the ashes, they would mix it with water. And it was specific cleansing, uh, and a lot of the cleansing for the ashes of the red heifer was anybody who became unclean by touching a dead body or somebody dying in their home, and they would have to be cleansed by this. Now, 
after they're in Israel, after they're in Jerusalem, they would take the ashes of the red heifer and mix it with water from the pool of Siloam. So the pool of Siloam water was the water, not any other pool, that was mixed with the ash to bring cleansing, ritual cleansing. Keep that in mind. It's a pool that would bring ritual cleansing when mixed with the ashes of the red heifer. Next, in John 7, another reference to something with this pool. And I'm going to pick up in John chapter 7. Um, let's look at... Um, we'll start now. Let me just start in verse... Uh, seven, verse 1. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Judea because they sought to kill him. Now the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. So, this is the Feast of Tabernacles. It's in the fall. It goes for eight days. And I'm going to skip to verse 37 now. On the last day, that great day of the feast. Now that last day of the feast also called the great day or the notable day. It was a custom that the priests would take a golden vessel. They would go down to the Pool of Siloam, take water from the Pool of Siloam, bring it up into the temple, and pour it out before the Lord. So, on the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, shouted, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Now, as this water is being poured out, Jesus says, if anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Now we know he's talking about the Holy Spirit. And we know that the Holy Spirit moves. He's the spirit of life. The spirit of life in Christ Jesus. If that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwell in you, he gives you life. He makes you alive, quickens you. But... The term together, living water, also means something more in Israel than it does in the rest of the world. Because you know, I've taught this before, when Israel, when Jewish people would go to a mikveh, the water had to be moving. It could not be a still pool. The water must come in and go out. And then it is technically called living water. It is moving water, but what is it for? Ritual cleansing. So once again, we see a connection between the Pool of Siloam, the lower pool, and ritual cleansing. Now, at the time that Hezekiah built that, it was for survival. It was to drink. It wasn't a cleansing pool. It was not a mikveh. It never was a mikveh. It was a pool to drink. It was drinking water. However, it was also utilized for ritual cleansing, but they did not take people into the pool. They took water from the pool. And it was for the ritual cleansing with the ashes of the heifer and ritual cleansing, uh, signifying ritual cleansing on that last day of the feast when they pour the water out before the Lord. And Jesus makes the connection and says, if you come to me, I will give you water and it's living water. In other words, where do we get cleansed? Through Jesus. We don't get cleansed anymore from a mikveh. And it's not just ritual. We are absolutely clean in the Lord, free from sin, whenever we allow Jesus to cleanse us by the blood of the Lamb. All right, now, let's go to um, John chapter 9. And this is where the Pool of Bethesda comes in. Now, let me just mention also, those of you who are on the last trip to Israel, remember, they were just finishing uncovering the street that went from the ancient street from the time of Jesus that went from the Pool of Siloam to the temple. Remember, they discovered that street. They were uncovering it. A lot of coinage indicating that it was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. And so up until now, we did not have a clear picture of what was happening in, in John chapter 9. But now we know there was a street that pilgrims would walk from the Pool of Siloam right up to the temple, or you could do it in reverse, walk from the temple directly to the Pool of Siloam. It was, it was connected on both ends. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. Where was Jesus? If you read chapter 8, he's in the temple. Jesus is in the temple, not in the temple temple, the temple compound, which was huge, as you know. And he sees this man born blind. 
His disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered and said, neither. You see, at the time, and even today, people will tend to think that somebody who is infirm or sick, that they did something uh, in a religious way. People will say, well, God has put that on you to punish you. You know, it, it's all the same thinking, and none of it is scriptural, no matter who says it. It can be you know, an, an, a, a, an ordained minister, a, a pastor, but if they say that God made you sick, it's not biblical. That is not biblical. And so here, Jesus says, neither. The man didn't sin, nor his parents. Now, he's not saying the man was perfect. Of course, they sinned, but he's saying that's not what's going on. But the works of God should be made manifest, shown. I must work the works of him who sent me while it's day. The night comes when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Now, let me just ask you a question. Since he went to heaven, who's the light of the world now? We are. Him in us, shining through us. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light. Now, he needs to shine. He wants to shine, and he will shine through believers, because he looked at us and he said, ye you, yeah, all of a sudden I, I lapsed into King James. Ye are the, the light of the world. You're the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, when he had thus spoken, he spit on the ground. There are two spitting miracles that I know of in the Bible. Two times. One time Jesus spit on the ground, this one. The other one, Jesus spit on a person. Spit on his tongue and on his eyes. To this day, I have yet to find a successful spitting ministry. I mean, not even in Tulsa. Nobody has tried that. Nobody says, all right, anybody, if you need healing, come up. Come up and form a line and I'm going to come spit on you. Just somehow, it doesn't seem to work today. I mean... Uh, I, if the Lord, well, no, listen, if the Lord tells me, yeah, I better not say that. All right. So Jesus spits on the ground, makes clay, makes mud, and he anoints the eyes of the blind man with the mud. And he said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. All right, now, they're up in the temple. Adjacent to the temple is the pool of Bethesda. Closer. Especially if you're blind and you can't see. Just outside of the temple compound, there are probably 20 or 30 mikvaot, ritual cleansing pools, a lot closer and basically on the same level. Because, as I mentioned, the pool of Siloam is identified with the city of David, which is here, those of you on me back up so those of you online can see here. And the temple is here. So this blind man being here, he's got to walk downhill to the Pool of Siloam. It is not as hard as it sounds because there is a road, but still, it's all the way downhill. Jesus is specific. Wash in the Pool of Siloam. Just like Naaman was told by the prophet, wash in the Jordan seven times. Wouldn't happen in six. Wouldn't happen in another river. Had to be the Jordan. Had to be seven. In obedience to the word of the Lord. So, when he thus, uh, and he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is my interpretation, sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. So he went, now just think about the way this worked. The pool of Siloam, I already identified two ways it was ritual cleansing. So the man who's blind gets mud in his eyes. Now, if you, if today you get something in your eye, what do you need to do? Wash it out. Cleanse it. And so he goes to the ritual, a, a pool that is known for ritual cleansing to cleanse his eyes of the mud. And as he gets the mud out of his eyes, he can see. There are a lot of us 
that need to come to Jesus to get the mud out of our spiritual eyes. That we can see clearly, that we can see supernaturally, that we can see what God is doing, where he's doing, who we are, what he wants us to be, what he wants us to do. Too many people are walking around spiritually blind. I'm talking about born-again believers, spiritually blind, unaware of the moving of the Spirit, unaware of the call of God, and unaware of our identity in Christ. And it's not going to be ritual cleansing because that mud was not going to be ritually cleansed. It was going to have to be washed out. That's the lower pool. Let's go to the upper pool. The upper pool is the Pool of Bethesda. Now, not all scholars, but many scholars identify the Pool of Bethesda of the New Testament with the upper pool of the Old Testament. And once again, it's drinking water. You will hear uh, that, and I've even said this prior to now, that, um, that the Pool of Bethesda was where the sheep were washed for the temple because it was just adjacent to the temple. However, it was originally meant as drinking water. So if it was drinking water, they would not wash sheep there. It was originally built for drinking water. So anyway, we're going to go to Isaiah 36. Isaiah 36. And in Isaiah 36, a reference to this pool. Verse 9. No, that's not it. I don't think I put a, a note there. Let me just go to it. Isaiah 36. And uh, we're going to look at uh, verse 2. Isaiah 36, verse 2. Now it came to pass in the 14th, it's verse 1, sorry. It came to pass in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, so it's again King Hezekiah, that Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the defense city of Judah and took them. So what we were talking about. So Hezekiah identified with the lower pool, but also with the upper pool. He didn't build it. But, and the king of Assyria sent Rabshakeh from Lachish. Now Rabshakeh is not the guy's name. I always thought it was the guy's name. It's not his name. It's his title. It's his position. A Rabshaka was the guy. I don't know if I'm saying that right. I have no idea how to say that word. But it's a guy who would go and uh, represent like an ambassador, but also a little bit more than an ambassador uh, because he had some military duties and he um, not really a governor, but a military duty and tax duty. So it was some it, but it was an official title. It wasn't the man's name. Anyway, he sent this one to Jerusalem to King Hezekiah with a great army. And he stood by the conduit of the upper pool. Now the conduit is a channel that brings water to the pool. The pool would not have water in and of itself. It wasn't for rainwater. There was apparently a channel, a water channel, a water conduit. Later on we called them aqueducts when the Romans built them, uh, but it would bring water. Now those of you who are in Israel, remember the aqueduct in Caesarea was right on the beach. That aqueduct was on arches. That aqueduct brought water from about 10 miles away. So this is without pumps. As you know, the water had, the aqueduct had to be graded so the water would run downhill. To tell you how hydraulic engineering was, uh, how advanced it was in the time of ancient Israel and in the time especially of King Herod, King Herod had fountains up on his palaces that were on hills. The only way you could get the water to go through a fountain up the hill is if it started at a higher level. So he had it calculated what the level of the water source was miles and miles away and then had it coming downhill from there to the bottom of his artificial tell, his artificial hill, and it would force it uphill because the source was higher. And not just force it uphill, the water would go up into pools, but it would have enough force that he could have fountains up on hilltops. That is the hydraulic engineering ability of the ancient Romans and ancient Greeks. So, that was just this little side issue. Anyway, here it says that it was by this conduit. Now, what did Rob Shekha do? If you know the story, I'm not going to read the whole story. He comes and he delivers a letter from Sennacherib to Hezekiah. But rather than speak in Aramaic, he doesn't speak in the Assyrian language, he speaks in Hebrew. So, immediately Hezekiah says, don't speak in Hebrew. Speak with me, I know Aramaic, I know, I know your language. Speak to me. And, and 
What does Rab Shekah do? He says, no, no, I want all the people to hear what we are going to do to them and to you unless you open your gates to us and you surrender. He wants to put fear. He's trying to spread fear. The Assyrians were the original, maybe not the original, but they were big time terrorists of the Middle East. They fought by terror because if they could terrorize a population into surrender, they didn't have to use their weapons. Nobody had to get hurt on their side. Of course, people would still get hurt on the other side. They typically, anybody want to hear what they would typically do? Or am I just, you know, like off? Yeah, they typically, once they would besiege a city that would not surrender, they would take the leading citizens, the leading men usually, and they would do several things to them right outside the main gate. They would take and they would impale them on poles, impale them, so the pole would come up through them, they'd of course die, or they would stake them down on the ground and flay them, take all their skin off. And that was, that was their terror tactic, and that word would spread. I mean, that was, they did it everywhere, so that word would spread. So when they would come to a city, and they would say, you know what happened in Lachish? You know what happened over here? You know what happened over there? That's what we're going to do to you unless you open your gates and surrender. We'll take you to a nice place. If they surrendered, they didn't do those things to the people. But they took them as slaves or they took them as a population transfer. They would take them and they would put them some other country and they would take people from another country and put them into this land. They disrupted the populations so there'd be no rebellion. So nobody could organize and have a rebellion. Anyway, so he talks by this pool. So this pool is uh, the pool where he announces this. And what does Hezekiah do? Hezekiah takes that letter, lays it down before the Lord and prays. And the Lord sends the prophet to say, I, the Lord, am going to take care of Sennacherib and his army. Don't surrender. And Sennacherib and his army are, are uh, besieged by a plague. And most of the army dies. Sennacherib lives. He goes back to Assyria. But most of the army dies. Three quarters of it or something dies. A tremendous plague. So all of those armed men were dead. Now, that happened right outside, right by the conduit to this pool. All right, now let's go to the New Testament, John chapter 5. This is our second pool. This is the upper pool. John chapter 5, verse 1. Now there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now in Jerusalem, by the sheep market, there's a pool, which is called in the Hebrew language Bethesda, having five porches. So the excavations there have found pools, various pools, and some of them are as deep as 40 feet, um, but others are not quite that deep. None of them have, uh, none of them are identified as mikveh, mikveh ot. So they believe that, the, and by the way, the pools were later on transformed by Hadrian, and there was a temple of Asclepius there and all kinds of other stuff. So there's, and plus in the, um, in the Byzantine time, there was a church there, a huge church, and then the Crusader time, another church. So there's been a lot of building going on there. So when we go to the Pool of Bethesda, it's pretty hard to see anything and see, try to figure out what in the world's going on. Very difficult. It's not like if you go to Jericho, where I excavated a pool, you see the pool. Nothing else. Desert, 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 pool. It's easy. You go to Bethesda, you have arches, you have buildings, you have debris, you have excavation, you have trenches, you have pool, you have pool. It's very difficult. So just trust me. All right. I got it all right, so I can keep going. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity 38 years. All right. You know the man was paralyzed. 38 years, paralyzed. When Jesus saw him lie there, and he knew that he had now lay, lay there a long time in that way, he said to him, will you be made whole? The impotent man answered him and said, sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I'm coming down, another one steps down before me and gets the healing. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. Immediately, the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. All right. What's happening here? 
the man, of course, is healed. But let's think about this a little bit more. Not just the healing from paralysis. 38 years of paralysis would breed 38 years of hopelessness, 38 years of depression, 38 years of being self-conscious, 38 years of being conscious that you cannot help yourself. You can do nothing to help yourself. Every time you try to get to the pool, you can't move. And there's nobody that's going to help you. 38 years to become bitter. 38 years to become resentful. 38 years to get angry at God. It's not fair. I can't get to the pool. 38 years to develop a pretty heavy attitude toward everyone and everything. 38 years to be miserable. 38 years to complain. 38 years to tell God that you just don't understand why he can't help you and won't help you. 38 years to develop a complex that you're not good enough. That he doesn't care about you. And Jesus says, you pick up your bed and walk. In other words, you do something and you will be free. He was freed from the paralysis and I believe also freed from any thoughts of depression, any thoughts of anger, negativity. I believe the man was set free. Now, I don't mean set free from demon possession. I mean set free from himself and from emotional depression. I believe that that place, the place was the, a, a place of plague and death, was also a plague of freedom for this man. It was a place where he was set free. We see the lower pool, a place of cleansing, and the eyes were cleansed. The upper pool, a place where Jerusalem was set free from the besieging armies of Assyria. And years later, this man set free from the besieging armies of thoughts, of physical infirmity. And it just goes together that there were two pools, thousands of years apart, different things happening, but along the same lines. Now, what does that have to do with us? Well, think about the word of God. If anyone ever tells you that, well, God's word was spoken and you no, know, it happened already. You no, know, it's a living word. And what was spoken years, thousands of years ago, still has a bearing on our lives today. Still affects us today, changes us today, brings miracles to us today because Jesus is the living word. And when we take the word of God and hide it in our hearts, we can be sure the spirit of God will work with it. Just as surely as when God looked into the chaos of creation and spoke the word and the spirit worked. The word of God gives the Holy Spirit something to work with. The word of God is the substance that the spirit of God will create through, change through, work through to bring about the will of God. Because the word of God is the will of God. And the word of God has been spoken by the spirit of God through humanity. It's people who wrote it down, but it was breathed by the spirit. So you can consider the word of God as spoken by God as surely as he said, let there be light. The spoken word of God, we are told, is the sword of the spirit. The spoken word of God, rhema, we like to call it, is something that is a defense for us. An offense for us, not offending, but an offense like an offensive weapon. It's something that is creative in and of itself. It's a seed because Jesus said the, the sower sows the seed. It's a seed and every seed has life within itself. Every seed is programmed for complete success. Every seed has the future within it. And so when we take that seed and we sow the seed, the living word of God, the future is assured as long as we don't fail by digging it up in fear, but we let it germinate in a place of unseen where it's not seen. That's the area where most of us give in because we can't see anything happening. And when we can't see anything happening, we're unsure. Fear can creep in. But just like the farmer does not sow the seed today and next week dig it up, let it rest. It will bring forth abundantly in our lives. It's living seed. That same pool 
that they would that they would celebrate cleansing was the pool where the man cleansed the mud from his eyes. Now think of it like this. The mud from his eyes is symbolic of the ashes mixed with water. The ashes mixed with water must have formed some kind of a mud or at least a dirty water. But it was mixing ashes with water. Jesus spit on the ground and mixed the water with the, the clay and made the mud. Very Is it by chance that that is so similar? And then he puts it on the place of need. When we take the word of God mixed with the spirit of God and put it on the place of need, we're healed, we're changed, we're made new. The upper pool, a place of withstanding, standing against the attack of the enemy, Assyria, later coming to be a place of healing. But only the healing was the first person who got in. Jesus changed it and said, you take up your bed. You act on my word. It's a place of action, acting on the word of God. When we act on the word of God, we get the miracle of God. Two pools and a miracle in the word of God, in Jesus' name. We can all act on God's word tonight. Whatever you have need of, act on God's word. You might say, I don't have God's word. Find the scripture that you have need of. Find the scripture that talks about your need. Mix the word of God with the spirit of God. Apply it to the area of your body that needs healing or the area of your life that needs healing. Then wash it off and watch God work.